everyone, another day of daily devotions and daily devoted towards growing in our faith, which means open up the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing of the Word. And so we thank you for uh, joining uh, us again. Uh, my name is Pastor Steve. A joy to be able to be with you. Um, we are in Matthew chapter 19, and it just dives right into it. It's uh, Jesus always tackling um, big issues, um, kind of controversial issues, uh, things that are close to the heart, um, things that are uh, things that we don't like to talk about sometimes. Um, and he, he aims right at it. Um, and so, uh, being part of the Word of God, we aim right at it. Matthew chapter 19, uh, coming. Uh, really out of his introduction or frankly his next layer of what the kingdom of heaven is truly all about uh, which is the forgiveness and the grace the, the the radical forgiveness the extreme grace of god in the kingdom of heaven um, of being able to forgive uh those who are sin sick um and then being able to just lavish upon them um his presence his love his forgiveness um when they don't even deserve it but also knowing that sin is serious um, and that continues on um, in our chapter for today. The sin is serious. Jesus tackles um, the reality of sin in our lives and the really understanding that uh, it's tough for us to really fight against it ourselves. Um, it's na natural for us. And you don't fight against something that's natural. Um, or rather, you just kind of walk in it. So Jesus is going to turn that um, in, a, in a little way here. So Matthew chapter 19, he goes right at um, the questions. Uh, uh, frankly, he is now in a different region. Um, and so let me uh, pull that up for you. Uh, this is where I'm standing. I'm actually standing at Jericho uh, right now, looking towards the Transjordan. Uh, the Jordan River is just right off of that horizon there. You can see a little bit of those hills on the other side. Um, that's uh, Perea at, at Jesus' time, Transjordan. Uh, but Jordan, um, as we would have now today in our contemporary world. So uh, let me show you that real quickly, um, and then we'll get into that context of being able to see. Okay, so here we have the area, the regions um, at Jesus' time. And so a lot of times you get to see here, here's the Sea of Galilee, um, and here's where he's a majority of the time, 75% of the time. We went up to Caesarea Philippi um, for the uh, gates of Hades, Matthew chapter 16, uh, back down to the northern region of the Sea of Galilee um, around there. Now he's taken the journey down to the Transjordan across the east side of the Jordan. And now he's doing, as we get to see here, um, ministry on this side, Perea. Um, or the Transjordan, which is Jordan nowadays. So um, that's where we have our context. Um, it is really directly, as you'd see here, I'm standing at Jericho in my background here. Um, so I'm looking east here over the Jordan, and you can see this uh, pretty mountainous on the other side, on the east side of the Jordan there. Um, but it is a direct shot really from Jerusalem. So there's going to be more Pharisees, there's going to be more Sadducees, there's going to be more teachers of the law around this region, around this area. Um, this is about 80 miles north up to Galilee, um, but this is only about maybe 15 miles, 20 miles, um, as we can see there from Jerusalem to this area that Jesus is doing ministry in. So um, as we get to see that, um, we'll see more questions coming uh, from the people from Jerusalem. Chapter 19, when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Excuse me for getting a little bit of a pause there. Sometimes I get a little mosquito that flies into my camera <laughs> um, and it makes it blurry because it's trying to focus on different things. So is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Well, Jesus said, haven't you read? He's going to go back to the scriptures. He's going to go back to the law. He replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Where does Jesus go? Does he go to the, does he go to Moses? Um, does he go to their law? Um, yes, he goes to the law, but he goes to God's original design. He goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where he brought Adam and Eve together. Um, and that's really a quote out, out of uh, Genesis, Genesis chapter uh, 2. And so he's, he's going back farther than design than what Moses is. They can really only get back to Moses. That's where their question is coming from. So that's why they said, verse 7, when then, they asked, why then? 
they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? So if you're saying that it shouldn't happen, then why did Moses permit it? And so what they're actually coming, uh, there, there's a tradition behind this. Um, there's a teaching behind this. There's two teachings behind this. One from Hillel and one from Shammai. Um, those are popular teachings uh, within the Torah, um, within the traditions uh, of, of Judaism. And so uh, let me help you uh, with those traditions. Um, Shammai would say that it was only lawful for a divorce. They would kind of take that permission of Moses. It was only lawful for divorce if the spouse was unfaithful in the relationship. Where Hillel um, would say uh, that it was uh, lawful for divorce if the spouse didn't like how the spouse was treated. Um, my notes in my Bible even say, and it goes drastic more than I was reading it more outside of these notes, but um, the note here, let me just read that to you real quickly. Um, uh, this Hillel understanding, which was uh, right in the time of Jesus, 60 BC to 20 AD, um, said, who becomes displeasing with their, dispou their spouse, his rooms for divorce. So he would allow a man to divorce his wife if she did anything he disliked, even if she burned his food while cooking it. So you see the parameters. You see, okay, um, we've had these teachings. We have these teachings of Shammai or Hillel. Which side do you take, Jesus? And he says, I take the design of God. <laughs> I take the design of God. I will speak towards the permission of Moses um, because that was really through the law. Um, but I will go back to the original design, how God intended it. And that's how we should always go back, how God intended it. Now, we don't always fulfill those intentions. There is divorce in our world. We don't make excuses for that. Um, do we think that's great? No, we don't think that's great. Does God think it's great? No, God doesn't think it's great. Um, there is forgiveness within divorce. But what's God's original design? That a man and a woman come together, that they're knit together, they are one. And so let's not separate that. That's God's original design. If that takes place, then what does the law say about that? that is, uh, and Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, Shammai, Jesus actually sided with the teaching, the Shammai teaching, except for marital unfaithfulness, and marries another woman, commits adultery. He doesn't, he doesn't permit it, but he doesn't excuse it either. I mean, I say, we know that this can happen in a fallen, sinful world. But I don't just excuse it of being able to say we can just do it haphazardly. That's not a big deal. It is a big deal. It is sin that can be forgiven. And so Jesus continues to put this forth on that says, hey, um, it's not great. God doesn't want that. But if it happens, uh, frankly, as we see here, don't let that continue on in your life. Verse 10, the disciples said to him, if this is a situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry Let's not even worry about, let's not even go down the hard realities of marriage, the hard realities of joining two together and seeing that as they are one, that there's always going to be tears. Marriage isn't easy. Relationships aren't easy. That's what the disciples are saying. So let's not even entertain it. Jesus says, no, no. Uh, here's what he says. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. Hey, um, we have the desires of marriage. We have desires between a man and a woman to come together. Um, let's not dismiss that. Let's not try to uh, run from that, Jesus is saying. Um, but for those that can't accept this, that they don't have those desires, uh, that's a blessing for them. Uh, those that uh, have been born that way, the ones that have been, uh, frankly, made that way, the ones that have actually had that discipline in their life, um, good for them. Good for them. This gets into our culture. I'm not going to get too deep into it today. Uh, maybe at some other time. But it says, Jesus continues on. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Others were made that way by men. And others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. This really speaks towards how we're shaped. People will go real quickly saying, oh, a eunuch. Uh, a eunuch is someone that doesn't have desires or doesn't have um, the ability uh, to be able to have what we'd say sexual desires uh, in, in that kind of way. Um, and so that's okay. That's actually, as Paul would say later on, a gift um, because it isn't your allotment in life. And so you take in, in humility, how God's made you, how God's placed you, what's your purpose, um, and being able to walk forward in that. Some have been made that way. Eunuchs have been made that way. A lot of times around queens in the palaces, the, the men that would serve the queen 
they would make into Unix, that they would take care of their manly system as we would have their genitalia so that they wouldn't have the desires um, to be able to go towards the queen. And so uh, that would be fixed in that kind of way. Um, but Jesus is saying here, um, let's, let's not run too fast real quickly that um, away from the design that we shouldn't even think about marriage or go towards marriage, um, go towards relationships, because God designed that in the beginning. So don't run from it, but also don't make excuses um, of how you can just continue to sin, um, whether it be through divorce, whether it be through homosexuality, whether it be through um, uh, improper, immoral relationships. Um, no, look at yourself, how God's designed you, what he's put in place, and walk according to his design. Let's continue to go on. It says, it takes a big shift here. Um, then verse 13, it says, uh, then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But disciples rebuked those who brought them. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Not just the people that can walk in the law, not just the people that can be seen as uh, reasonable and knowledgeable. No, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these children. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Verse 16, this gets into a great rhetoric here um, because it talks really more about salvation rather than the righteous acts of the people. We've been there, kind of the righteous act of forgiveness, the righteous acts of, uh, of marriage, the righteous act of um, being uh, fruit faithful um, to God's kingdom. Um, this is where it really comes forth because now in verse 16, now a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And right there from the set go, um, yes, as a Lutheran, we get, whoa, that squirms us real quickly <laughs> uh, because it's being as, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We know, Jesus knows, the kingdom of heaven knows that it's nothing that I can do to inherit eternal life or gain or merit eternal life. That has to come on the work of Christ. Um, but in his system, um, in the Judaic system back at Jesus' time, they were righteous by their works. And so they were saying, what must I do? What must I do to merit God, to uh, fall into his grace, to be able to uh, uh, please him so that I can have eternal life? That's their system. That's their mindset. And so he comes with that question. Um, Jesus attacks real quickly and says, huh, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. There's only one who is good. We are not by, frankly, nature good. We're actually by nature sinful. But there is one who is good that actually made a good creation. Um, and so Jesus is bringing back to the beginning once again and saying, there's only one that's good. Um, if you want to enter life, obey the commandments because they come from the good father. They come from a source of good. Those are what the commandments are. So if you want to enter life, and he's talking about life everlasting um, or even life to its fullness, obey the commandments. Check the Torah. <laughs> Okay, easy uh, question for this guy. He says, which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. What is that? The second tablet. What is not there in the commandments? Everything in the second commandments, and besides, um, it even says that, right? Murder, adultery, steal, false testimony. We would go run through all of the commandments except for what? Covet. You shall not covet. That's something that this man was struggling over. Covet and riches. Coveting the richness that he, the wealth that he has. That's why Jesus went right towards him and says, all this I have kept, the young man said. I mean, what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Ah, come follow me. Now this when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. He coveted wealth. He covered comfort in his life. And he says, no, I want you to be uncomfortable in the kingdom of heaven. Um, we don't, we're not just called to just be uncomfortable, but it's not great to just have the comforts because they can become idols. And his idol was wealth. And his idol uh, was coveting um, of the wealth that he could just store up in his storehouses. And Jesus went right at it and just says, ah, your sin, if you want to be perfect, if you want to say um, that you've kept all these um, then go sell everything you have and then come follow me, right? But really where this is pushing it, that he had an idol, that he had a God 
And so really Jesus coming back to the relationship, back to the beginning of the relationship with God and his creation. And which one is those? Yeah, the first three commandments, the first tablet of the commandments. He, uh, Jesus went right back there and being able to say, your relationship with God is something that needs to be brought forth. Not what you can do to be able to inherit, inherit eternal life. You need to know who God is and what he's doing for your salvation. And this is something that's really, I love this. I have this little note. Let me read it to you because I love, whenever I come to the Matthew 19, I love reading this little note next to me. I, I don't know where I got it from, um, but it's a little note. It says, Jesus wants all to follow him. He is not a source of information. He is the source of salvation. Let me read that again to you. Jesus wants us all to follow him not so that we would be educated, not so that we would know certain things of the kingdom of God. No, we don't need to know information from Jesus. We need to know salvation from Jesus. And so what must I do to inherit eternal life? Follow Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of life everlasting. He is salvation. The disciples finally got it later into the gospel a little bit, and they would say, uh, are you going to leave too, Jesus said? You know, when, when our downcast face, when we're kind of attacked in sin, and we can't, we have these idols and say, uh, are you going to leave too because I'm, I'm just drilling into the kingdom of heaven? And his disciples say, where else could we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus isn't a source of information. He is the source of salvation. So when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And frankly, he couldn't cast away that idol. When Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's a great idol in his life, the riches. Again, I tell you, it is easy for a camel, the biggest animal in Palestine at that time, to go through an eye of a needle, literally an eye of a needle, really, uh, really small. So a big thing going through a small thing, it's, it's harder. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Because his priority is his richness, his wealth, an idol, a God. And so the kingdom of heaven is really to be a humble servant, um, to be able to be called into the kingdom of heaven is to have God as your authority and nothing else. Not money, not riches, not fame, uh, not possessions. Um, this is where it just crumbled upon this guy. It's really hard uh, for rich men because they have the wrong priorities. They have the wrong authority um, in their life. Salvation doesn't come from our works. Salvation comes from Christ alone, his works through the kingdom of heaven that God has placed, thanks be to God. And so within that, um, he sets his disciples straight. Um, there's another reality, the eye of a needle is a place on a wall, um, as some people say too, uh, that a camel would be coming through and they couldn't come through this wall unless they unpacked everything um, from their journey so that they could actually crawl through this place in the wall, an eye of a needle in the walls of cities. Um, and so they would have to take all their uh, possessions off and then go through and then bring on their possessions. Um, that's a great kind of uh, uh, relatable story um, for this as well, but it really is the big reality of the biggest animal going through an eye of a needle. Seems impossible. And that's where Jesus says, when the disciples heard this, they, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Because their system was still righteous by works. Jesus is moving towards grace and uh, grace by faith, right? Um, who can do this? Right? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. It's impossible to merit eternal life. But with God, all things are possible. And he's putting things in place in the kingdom of heaven for these things to be possible in Jesus Christ. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will be there for us? They've left everything. They left their nets. They left their families. Jesus recognized that. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the 12 thrones. A little precourse to, you can see this in Revelation chapter 4, that the apostles will be sitting on the throne, um, right around the throne of God, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, overseeing them, that they get to understand the fulfillment over the tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. So setting forth, we're going to get into that last phrase next because he picks it up again in chapter 20. Um, but within this, he gets to see that um, when we have the authority right in our life, when we actually understand that we're a creation and we have a cre creator, that we're a creature, that there is a creator and he has all authority in heaven and on earth uh, to do what he has determined. Uh, that's when we give thanks in our life 
Uh, that's when we can, yes, leave our possessions, leave our family, leave our, because uh, come what may, I believe in God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit, who has enlightened me with the gifts of the gospel. And that is my authority. That is my thanksgiving. That is my life. May I not be curb, may, may, may I not be persuaded, um, desert, abuse this calling that I have as being a child of God, but more importantly, the grace and the faith given to me by the power of the Holy Spirit. May I just walk in that and not just try to receive information about my faith, but celebrate the salvation that I have by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we walk in a sin fallen world, but thanks be to Jesus that we have won the victory over sin, death, and the devil, and that we can walk in these times, yes, even in this time right now, knowing that God is with us, knowing that God loves us, knowing that God is forgiving us, and he's just not giving us information every day. No, he's giving us the great attitude, the great thankfulness, and the great faith to say that I'm saved through Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Have a beautiful day giving thanks to God and all you do for the salvation that he has given to you in Jesus.